Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Mill. Hi, everybody. I am Dead Alcoholic, and it's great to be here. Uh, wow. I loved hearing the introductions of people. I mean, they're all over the world here at this group. Isn't that the coolest thing? And the that we get to reach out and while virtually touch each other's hand and see each other's faces, the spirit is alive and well and clearly in this group. So thank you for the invitation to share on this very key topic in my life, and that's sponsorship. Um, it, it just is a vital component. Uh, as much as prayer and meditation time, as much as going to meetings, uh, it is a vital, vital component to my recovery. So sponsorship, do we still honor the practice or is it a dying art? And that might seem like a strange thing to say, but I know so many people who don't sponsor. I know people who choose not to sponsor. I'm really glad that there was the announcement, if you're willing to sponsor, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the fact that, you know, I've actually been in rooms where I was the only person that raised my hand willing to sponsor is a very, very sad thing. What are we passing on or what are we not passing on? Have we become so soft? Call me when you feel like it. I never feel like it. Okay. Call me when you feel like drinking. I don't feel like drinking. And yet these kind of, this kind of thinking doesn't lend for group creation or solid recovery. It, it, because I used to think AA was about just not drinking and going to some of those meetings. So let me give you a little bit of the stats for me. Um, so my sobriety date, uh, it's not my first one, but it's my current one is February the 8th, 1976, which means I've been with you for over 46 years. My, uh, home group. Now I've, like I said, I had those before, but I did not keep them, nor did I enjoy having a sobriety date. But when I asked the long timers, what do you do to stay sober? This is the formula for success, as I like to call it, that they gave me. Now, I had the first of the seven items. But the reason I have, still have this one is because of the remaining things that they shared with me. And so much of this is guided by sponsorship, be it verbally guided or by example. They said to me, we go to a lot of meetings and we get a home group. As mentioned, my home group is also named the primary purpose group. We are independent of the other primary purpose groups around the world. That's a popular title and it's a, I love it. It is the purpose of our group is to carry the message. And we meet Monday nights. We are, we just kind of went, I mean, while we're hybrid, the Online is simply audience, so you can view and attend the meeting, but there's no online interactivity. So anybody wanting that information later, I'm happy to share that. We're Monday nights, 8 p.m. to 9.15, an open speaker meeting in Dublin, California. They said that we get a sponsor or a mentor, if, that, if you're not sure what that means, and we'll review that very much today. We get a sponsor, and and I have been blessed with four sponsors. I had Marguerite in Atlanta. I had Joe in mini, in, excuse me, Marguerite in Minneapolis. Joe in Atlanta, what, Millie in Southern California, and when I moved to Northern California, I kept her, and we were together over thirty three years. The day she died, with over fifty years of sobriety, and this was a couple years ago now. 
That very same day, I called my current sponsor, Marilyn S. of Los Angeles, and we set up a time for the next day to talk about sponsorship, and I've been with Marilyn ever since. As important to me as having a sponsor is sponsoring. And again, how do you get a sponsor? What do you do with them? We'll share about that in a minute. They're also expected to sponsor and to be or be of service in AA, because if you're not willing to do that, well, that's fine. But then just step aside because you don't need me as a sponsor. I am an activist. And if you want to be a deadbeat, do that on your own time, not mine. But if you want me to sponsor, we're going to step this up and get to work. They said we take the steps and I've taken them numerous times for myself. Uh, but again, as importantly, step 12 tells me, hey, you've had a spiritual awakening. It's not about let's go back and do more analysis, you know, of yourself. Hey, why don't you go grab somebody and help them have a spiritual awakening? And again, that's often done as a sponsor, help them walk through the 12 steps. They said those traditions, those aren't just for the group. You're a member of a group. You, you need to know how they apply. And oh, by the way, why don't you see how they apply in your personal life? And again, I'm a three legacy sponsor. I also walk through everyone with steps, traditions, and concepts because the traditions in my personal life have made incredible, they're the best quote self-help guides I know of regarding relationships, whether it be with one other person a friend, a family member, a, a, my group, my community. They're the, the best common sense tools I did not have in how to have like grown up relationships with people and be of service. And so service can be our third legacy of the concepts, learning about those. It also was clear that service was the thing you did outside of the group level. You always had a commitment at your home group, but doing the stuff outside, seemingly inconvenient, 12-step work, having your name on the 12-step call list at your local central office, being a general service representative or inner group representative or uh, what we call hospitals and institutions, carrying the message into those who cannot get out service finds be on a conference committee find outside seemingly inconvenient ways and then carry the message and those three those six things there are the message of how i have stayed here one day at a time with the relationship of a higher power and but i need something with skin on it and that tends to be in sponsorship. Now, we've often heard, again, there's the sponsorship can go from lackadaisical, take a bubble bath and call me if you feel like drinking, to brush your teeth, call me, have your breakfast, call me, to the militant. What might work for you now might not work a little bit later on. But I don't think there's any mistake I think it's all part of our development on how and who we have as sponsors. They all teach us things. They all set our example. So with you, is it a dying art or is it something you still honor the practice of? Okay. So the very first pamphlet, I guess I'll take this down a little bit or so you can see the... Uh, whole page. Let me see. I think there's a fit to page. There you go. Sorry, I wish I could make that bigger. Um, there's the very first pamphlet that was ever created on sponsorship was by Clarence S. of Cleveland, 1944. It's quite fascinating. They did not sugarcoat this thing at all. You're either all in or step aside. You're either in this deal or you're not, because again, half measures we know avail us nothing. This is still something that you can probably find if you Google it on the internet somewhere. But basically, Clarence's message was, if you're going to be a sponsor, be a good one. That means take that time to listen. Take that time to spend time with that individual. 
be the guide. Don't just have a numbers game. The more you have, the more important you might feel. No, let's, let's take that seriously. Okay. Some years ago, a friend of mine who's passed on and in the big meeting, as we call it, in the sky, he spoke at our group and he was sharing about when he asked his sponsor to sponsor him. And so he asked him and he says, Joe, let's get this straight. I don't sponsor sponsees. I sponsor sponsors. And I loved the statement because, again, I'm going to groom you how to groom and help others. So my, my, my take to my sponsees, take good notes. Because it's not about me walking you through the steps over and over and over. The real way you're going to take those in, once you and I've walked through that, is when you walk someone through it. It's not about being a taker anymore. It's about being a giver. So I've always loved that quote that he said. So where do you find out about sponsorship? Well, we have some pamphlets. Now, I know we have people around the world. You might have some different pamphlets in your general service structure, but here in the U.S., Canada, um, this is a pamphlet called Q&A, Questions and Answers on Sponsorship. You can get this from aa.org. Again, it has some great experiential guidance on it. There's also a wonderful booklet that the Grapevine has produced called One on One, all about sponsorship. Now, these Grapevine booklets are designed to, uh, they, they, they're already previously published articles from the Grapevine going back to June of 1944 when we started, uh, the Grapevine started, I should clarify, and they theme it. And so there's about 17, 18 books out right now, booklets, and they themed on maybe it's making amends, maybe it's uh, international, maybe it's women, maybe it's sober and out, LGBTQ+. So here's one on sponsorship. So we have three legacies that we know. We have recovery, which is the 12 steps. We have unity, which is our 12 traditions. And we have service, which is our 12 concepts. And there was a past trustee, and he said, in the summer of 2019, in a box 459, which is free, by the way, quarterly through our general service office. It's a fabulous quarterly publication you can sign up for, get on email. He said, sponsorship is the silent legacy of our fellowship given to us by those who went before us. Isn't that what typically most of us have sponsors who have been here longer than we are? Does it that's not a requirement because sometimes when you get a little long in the, in the years, it's harder to find somebody who's ahead of you, still alive, still active, et cetera. It's like kind of hard sometimes. He says it can spell the difference between survival and stagnation. Too many times I hear of long timers like myself in their 40s, for example, or some even in their 30s, that when their original or first sponsor dies, they don't get another one. I'll tell you that when I asked Marilyn, I was 43 years sober, eight days shy of my next birthday. And I couldn't have thought a scarier thought than I don't need a sponsor. I should know this stuff. Oh, no, I need a sponsor because I know my ego. I know my thinking. I know that I still think, feel, and want to straighten people out. I know that I choose to have accountability to someone. She doesn't demand it. I choose to have that so that it doesn't run wild. It doesn't get out of shape. Because I'm the one who will pay the price for that. The humility that having a sponsor, someone I choose to be accountable to is very important to me. So oftentimes it's asked, did Bill have a sponsor, our co-founder, Bill Wilson? Yes. He always acknowledged Ebby Thatcher, the man who paid the 12-step call on him in November of 34, as his sponsor. 
Now, we know, if you know a little bit about history, that Ebby did not have constant sobriety. He did die with two years, though. He was two years sober, but Bill always referred to him as his sponsor. So if our co-founder, Bill, had a sponsor, do you? If you don't, why not? I mean, maybe you can get a little passive your sponsor died yesterday or last week and you just haven't. But you see, even though my sponsor was of an elder age, I always had a backup in my mind. They didn't know it because it was subject to change. I might meet someone in the last two years, five years, whatever it could have been, but I always had a backup. And if you, if, and do you sponsor? And if not, why not? And we'll kind of touch on some of the things that appear to be uh, concerning on sponsorship. Okay. So what is sponsorship? Well, from our booklet, Q&A on sponsorship, it says, what does AA mean by sponsorship? To some organizations, you must have a sponsor, a person who vouches for you, presents you as suitable for membership. Now, <laughs> aren't we glad we don't have that, right? This is definitely not the case with AA. Anyone who has a desire to stop drinking is welcome to join us. In AA, sponsor and sponsored meet as equals, just as Bill and Dr. Bob did. Essentially, the process of sponsorship is this. An alcoholic who has made some progress in the recovery program shares that experience on a continuous sorry, <clears throat> individual basis with another alcoholic who is attempting to attain or maintain sobriety through AA. There's another thing about sponsorship I like there too. Why? Why should we do it? Well, on page 26 of that pamphlet, it says co-founder Dr. Bob said, and you can also find this in his story in, in the big book, I spend a great deal of time passing on what I learned uh, to others who want and need it badly. I do it for four reasons. Number one, it's a sense of duty. Two, it is a pleasure. Boy, we know that when I'm thinking about me and all of a sudden that phone rings, I'm not thinking about me anymore. I'm thinking about you. How can I be useful and helpful? Number three, because in doing so, I'm paying my debt to the man who took time to pass it on to me. Isn't that also part of my responsibility as a member of AA? Now, if you're just a visitor, that probably won't matter. But if I'm a member of AA, I have a responsibility here. Membership's an action word to me. It's not just a word. It's not a right. Four, because every time I do it, I take out a little more insurance for myself against a possible slip. I... I really believe in that. I've been on many 12-step calls over the phone, those that have allowed me to come over to help and have, you know, have a conversation. Still, they, they still happen if you have your name listed with the 12-step hotline list at your local office. They still happen. I would rather be the one receiving the call than making the call. And this is one other reason why I do that. I don't ever want to forget where I have come from. And there were people there, whether I had asked or not, when, when I walked into that meeting, there were people there available and willing. They weren't officially entitled a sponsor, but they were there to be of help. To me. When are you ready to sponsor? Sometimes we don't feel ready. And, and I realize if you're a week or two sober, you might not feel ready. But this should be also something you talk to your sponsor about. But it says there are no specific rules, but it's a good sponsor probably should have a year or more away from the last drink and should seem to be enjoying the emphasis enjoying as me, my doing, 
sobriety. Do you look like someone who's enjoying sobriety when you're in the rooms? Or do you look like you just ate a lemon? I mean, my God, is somebody going to walk over to that and say, you are the kind of person I want to have as my sponsor? I don't think so. If you roll in three seconds before the meeting, leave right after and you wonder, why don't I have any sponsees? I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. First of all, get there early. Do you look like someone who's enjoying sobriety? Do you ever look at your own face, whether it's in the mirror, whether it's on Zoom? What do you look like? Would you be attracted to you as a sponsor? You can answer that yourself. It says the most successful sponsors seem to be men and women who've been in AA long enough to have a good understanding of the AA program outlined in the 12 steps. Many of us think it wise to seek advice from our own sponsors about when we may be ready to take on the responsibility of sponsoring another alcoholic. The sponsor should have capacity for understanding, patience, and the willingness to devote time and effort to new members. If you're taking a call and multitasking, they know. They don't feel like you are giving them a focused time. So once again, we'll, we'll talk about what does that look like? Okay, so before you dive into sponsoring, let's ask, do you have a sponsor? If you have a sponsor, these are some things you need to know. Do you know where they live? Maybe you haven't been to their home, but do you know where they live? Do you know where they attend meetings? Do you attend meetings with them where possible? With Zoom, that's pretty much possible. Do you know their last name? And please don't give me, well, we're an anonymous program, Baloney Mahoney, okay? If you don't know your sponsor's last name, you're still anonymous. Know, they, knowing people's last names for me makes you a real person. I can have enough John Doe's and call them John D's, but they don't really exist much in connectivity in my world. So know your sponsor's last name. Do you have their phone number memorized? You might think that's silly and old school. I, it is. But on the other hand, I don't ever want to, I still dial my sponsor and my husband longhand, as I call it. I don't speed dial them. I don't quick dial them. I don't voice dial them because I want their number emblazoned in my mind. I don't want to hear my phone died. I forgot their number. The dog ate the phone. No, no, not going to work. Not going to work. And what attracted you to your sponsor? Do you pass that on? Was it maybe they were kind, they were inviting, they invited you to meetings? Are you doing that for other new people? Did they offer to read the big book with you? Are you doing that with other people? Did you see them active in service? Are you doing that? What attracted you to your sponsor? Are you being that kind of sponsor too? It doesn't mean by any means, I want to create a mini me. Oh, no. I want to help you as a sponsor become the right person for you in sponsorship and in your AA recovery world to be the best you are using the three legacy tools of this program. So how do you get a sponsee? Well, first of all, as I kind of mentioned, if you're rolling in moments before the meeting starts, and we have a lot of in-person meetings, more and more we're starting in person and we all know that. If you're rolling in just beforehand, if you're leaving as soon as it's over, pretty unlikely you're going to get a sponsee. About a month ago, I'm talking to a friend of mine who I met through a business arrangement, and I would have him do some engraving. And one day he, you know, some years ago, he asked what it's for. And I said, well, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm having these engraved for sponsees of mine. And we've had a beautiful, you know, business relationship. Well, finally, one day he said to me, I'm sober 
eight months or something like that. I'm like, ma, that, that's it, right? So about, he's now a roughly a year and a half sober, year, eight months sober. And I had a big event that was involving a lot of sponsorship, my sponsorship lineage. He said, I'd go. I said, oh my God, we had a blast. We had a great turnout. I said, now, do you have any sponsees yet? He said, no, I don't. I'm trying. Okay, well, what are you doing? Well, I talk in meetings, you know, even when I don't feel like it. Uh, let me just tell you, that's not going to get you a sponsee. I can assure you that. That's not going to happen. If you want a sponsee, here are some ways to do it. Number one, get there early. Five minutes isn't early. In an in-person meeting, you need to be there at least 20 to 30 minutes early so that you're ready for it and watching that door for that unfamiliar face. You don't know if they just had their last drink in the parking lot or if they're 500 years sober. You don't know. But you've never met or seen that person at your group before. You have a responsibility to greet that person and welcome them and find out. A hi, how are you? That's just a drive-by. Don't even bother. Don't think you're doing somebody a favor with a hi, how are you? Engage. A warm handshake. Hey, I haven't seen you here before. You can ask some questions like, I mean, not an interrogation, but hey, are you new to AA or new to our area? Uh, how'd you find out about our meeting? Let me tell you about the format. Let me enter. Would you like to meet some of the other people? Would you like a phone list? Do you have any literature? I mean, just some basic questions to get an idea who the person is that you've never met before. I said, and, and then you, if it's somebody new, exchange phone numbers and you call them the next day. I know there is a long standing, hey, if they want it, they'll call me. Uh, did you call people when you were new or did you pitch the phone numbers like most of us do? Okay. It's a rare pretty cat that that newcomer is going to call you the next day. Pretty rare. Ah, they don't know me. I don't want to bother them. I don't, I, what do I say? That's why I need to break the ice. That's why I need to call them. Hey, I'm Debbie. I met you at the XYZ meeting last night. Just, I know new sobriety can be kind of scary. I want to make sure that if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. But here's the meetings I'm going to this week. I'd be happy to meet you there. Pick you up, meet you early if you'd like. And I invite them to things going on in the area. They don't know about those. It's all foreign and strange. I make that call three times. And if I keep getting a no, then I'll say, please, I don't, I don't want you to feel like I'm stalking you. I just want to reach out and offer a friendly hand. But please keep my number. And if I can be of any help, please let me know. I want them, if they never make it back to AA, I want them to know that somebody seemed to care. They were nice people. I just wasn't ready. I want them to know we do care. And that's based on my actions, not theirs. Okay. Here's another way. I mentioned earlier that I have been in meetings where they said, and I've just dropped in. I'm, it's not a regular meeting for me. I'm just like, hey, I haven't been to this meeting. Check it out. And they'll say, anybody available for sponsorship? And I was the only one that raised my hand. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. There isn't one person in this room willing to help somebody else. Holy, but what are we passing on? Service is optional? Whoa. Uh-uh. Let me also give you a clue. This is not raising your hand. Don't bother. Nobody sees this. Don't throw us a crumb. Full extension above the heads is raising your hand, okay? Don't even go there. Just forget it. I have, spon I have sponsees tell me, God, I sponsor so many. I don't have enough room. 
Now, I'm not the person to say that to, okay? Don't tell me you have, quote, too many sponsees. I still raise my hand. I got plenty. But here's why I still raise my hand for a number of reasons. Number one, I want to set the example that, wow, she's raising her hand and I know how many people she sponsors. I better raise my hand. You bet your buns. Okay, number two, don't worry. You're not going to be flogged with 40 people coming up cra craving your sponsorship. Not going to happen. But you set the example and you set the willingness when you raise your hand. So that people see service is alive in you. Now, what do you do when somebody does ask you? Here's what I do. I know that I'm not the sponsor for everybody. I'm not militant, but I'm structured. I'm, a, I'm moderately structured, I would say. You don't have to call me after you brush your teeth and make your bed and have your breakfast and get to work. No, I don't have availability for that many phone calls. Okay, that's not what I'm here to do. Micromanage your life. But I want to be in the loop of it. I never say no, but I don't always say yes. And what does that mean? That means I know how difficult it was to pick up that thousand pound phone or to come and approach me because I like to be approachable. I like to, I don't like getting bogged down in meetings talking to just one person. Gosh, I feel trapped. I want to work the room. Okay. And so I, I want to stay open and available if someone wants to have a conversation with me. So I know how hard that is. My answer is, I would love to have a conversation with you about that. Let's, let's meet for coffee. And we set up a date and time. And I say, bring a pen and paper, plan for about an hour and a half. And let's have a conversation what that looks like. Now, for example, I just met with someone uh, Sunday. We had coffee, pen and paper. We, she's four plus years sober. She is seven months pregnant and first child. And so we reviewed what's your sponsorship history, just, just to get an idea. And I, told, I tell her mine, sober time, your sobriety date, what are you doing in service? Tell me about your prayer and meditation life. Um, not that there's anything wrong. It's just maybe I'll suggest some, let me bump this up. Tell me about the, you know, what we do with seventh tradition. We don't dress down for a meeting. We dress up appropriately. So um, calls, what that looks like, what your meeting behavior looks like. We review all those kinds of things. And then I said to her, um, I'm going to introduce you to a bunch of the women at this particular meeting we're going to go to after our coffee who have had been moms in sobriety and currently have little ones. How did they navigate sober life, motherhood, working? I don't know. I have no children. So this is a whole world that takes special navigation. And I don't know how to do that. So I want to introduce you to these other ladies who do. I also ask them, I want you, and again, this is, again, somebody who's four plus years sober, currently has a sponsor. Tell me some reasons why she's looking to move on, but, you know, it's not horrible. And I said, and I want you to give this some prayer and meditation time tonight. And let's have, you know, talk tomorrow and we set the time. And let me know what you think. Either way is fine. But I want you to really think about making this move in a new direction. If you don't, there's no contract to sign. There's no obligation. I don't want you to think, oh, what have I done? I'm, oh, my God. Is this the, 
what that what's that uh, buyer's remorse I bought a lemon car kind of you know thing so, so give it some time and either way is okay we've made a nice little opening on friendship and we'll see what meetings if, if this isn't working for you now every now and then when I get that call it's you know I think I'm going to just stay where I am right now I have a lot of changes coming up hey understood no problem I am always available. Feel free at any time to give me a call. Always available. So I want that I have found this and I've done this probably for the last 15, 16 years since I turned about 30 years sober. Instead of it be an honor, I'll do it. Let's let's start the book tonight. I don't really have that bandwidth available. And because I'm an active sponsor, not a micromanager. I don't have time for that, nor interest, but I want to be knowing what's going on in your life. I, I mean, I might have a little bit of a memory lapse of some of the details, but I'm in communication with everyone I sponsor on a weekly basis in some fashion. It, mostly it's by phone, but if for some reason that can't happen that week, Email or send me a quick text what's going on is sufficient. But that's 1% of the communication. Otherwise, it's voice to voice. Most of my calls I take in the morning. I am not camera ready at that point. So we do it on phone. We don't do it by Zoom, okay? Because I'm not going on Zoom unless I am. And I start early in the morning with those calls. And it's pushing at noon, Monday through Thursday to be camera ready. Let me tell you. <laughs> so, woo, you know, we, because <laughs> I'm generally on the phone till about 11 o'clock. So now I assure you, we do not dally on the phone. We don't talk about hair and nails and manis and pedicures. Okay. We, we, we get to focus. We have a purpose. It's not about the frivolous stuff. It's about what can I do to help whatever's going on for you today? Okay. What do I ask of them? All right. As I said in that conversation, now, uh, I'm not sure, Mel, I don't, because I have the screen share up, I can't see the timer person. You've got 15 um, minutes left, about 15 one, minutes. One five? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll kind of keep a watch. Okay, to the top of the hour. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so what do you ask of them? Well, as I shared, um, minimum three meetings a week. What does that look like? Again, if you can, if your health and condition allows you to go in person, to go in person. Minimum 20 minutes before the meeting, preferably more. You'd be one of the last people to leave. You work the room. That means you say hello to everyone. An eye to eye, hello, so-and-so, good to see you. If you ask the question, how are you? Stay for the answer. Don't just, hi, hi, how are you? As you're strolling by, stay for the answer. Be familiar with your services of the group, your literature table, how things Operate. What are your group's customs? Your home group should get more of everything of you. It should be a non-negotiable night or meeting, whichever you get. My home group needs to be a three legacy group. I encourage them to have the same thing where they're involved with service structure, active in sponsorship. They have the three legacies on the wall. Okay. The three window shades. Uh, so meetings, uh, that you are engaged in some kind of service that uh, you sponsor. And sometimes, I, I mean, I've got a couple of gals that just their sponsorship needle does not move. Their one or two seems to be sufficient. And that's not okay. Again, would you sp ask you to be their sp my, your sponsor? I mean, so why would anybody else? Let's get that some attraction going on here. Uh, your money, whatever you're doing, can you 
bump that up a little bit to where you're going and then double that for your home group because that should have more of everything of you. Your time, your services, your efforts, your money. You go to the business meetings, you participate in the group activities whenever possible. Prayer and meditation. Strengthen that. That is something that we can do to perfection. It really is. Those morning prayers, that morning conscious contact with your higher power and the review at night, which I call step 11, and closing out my day again with a higher power. Um, to find your ways to be of service, to stay in touch with me. Again, um, and the, the relationship with me is based on you, not me. This is why in my world, it's better to, if anybody wants to talk to me, it's always better if we set up a time because then I'm going to be presently there for your call. So I make committed phone call times and uh, they have a time, date and a time. I'm, ex I'm there, they're there, we connect. They don't have to wonder if I'm going to answer the phone. They expect it and I expect them to be my caller. And here's your, typically it's 15 minutes. Let's get to the point. What can I, what's going on for you today? How can I be of help? Share my experience. So what do, that's some of the things I ask of them. Common pitfalls of early sponsoring. I think I have to have all the answers. I'm afraid I might say something wrong. This is kind of both of those things to, things to overcome. I'm going to kill the sponsee. You know what? You have no power to do that. I can't make him drink and I can't make him stay sober. I don't have the power. Booze didn't kill him. I'm not going to kill him. Okay. I may not be the best guide for them. The one they connect to the most. But I don't have to have all the answers, nor will I. The other thing is. I only use AA or grapevine produced literature. I don't say conference approved because that would be limiting because all of our literature purpose is conference approved in purpose. Sometimes the content is, but sometimes the nature of the, like the guidelines, they don't conference approve every guideline update, but the purpose is approved by the General Service Conference. So I don't introduce any literature outside of what we produce. Be and the reason is that if I just stick to my own experience, not my opinions, those are debatable. My experience is not. And our literature which is done by committee, not an individual, that if they need something else, if they need professional help, if they choose to find outside literature, by all means. But I don't want to introduce that to imply, A, -A literature is great, but you know what? Here's this new fandangled way to write an inventory or do a ninth step amends or we'll get to God. Because in five years, there'll be another new one. That one's passe now. This is the new Fandangled. For 46 years, the only literature I have used and feel very successful about is ours. Do you familiarize themself with them with AE's history? I think that's a blessing. And even though when we go through the big book and we start with the preface and all the forewords, I want them to know what they're involved in that next month we're 87 years old. That's a person's lifetime. There wasn't hope for the alcoholic before that. One alcoholic helping another often is the basis of sponsorship. And this is why it's important they know how many people have helped another AA and were there when they came to their first meeting what if they'd all said, you know, gee, there's a good game on tonight. I want to go to the movies. It's our anniversary or this or that. Somebody will be there. And it was empty. Because everybody thought someone else would be there. And you walked in and wondered, I thought, I thought AA was here. 
I have a responsibility that I take very seriously. Do you review the 12 steps and 12 concepts with them as well? At least introduce them to that. There's plenty of Zoom concepts and tradition studies. If you're not familiar with it, perhaps you could guide them to that. I find it really, really key that they know about these too. These are not just for those people, whoever they are. I get, there's so many gems and jewels in here. If I don't treat them or expose them to the other three, I'm cheating them. If I give them only the 12 steps, I'm cheating them out of two thirds of our program. Wow. I think, again, look at it as I have a greater responsibility than say, sure, I'll sponsor. Give me a call now and then. How enmeshed should you get with a sponsee? I, I've seen some of my sponsees get too involved and too friendly. And all of a sudden, when they have to put their sponsor hat on, the sponsee is offended. I thought you were my friend. I can't believe you spoke to me like that. They take, you see, I keep a very clear line. I'm compassionately detached. I care very deeply about each one I sponsor and what's going on in their life but I don't emotionally take it to be mine. This is where the three legacies comes in. How can we use them to give you some guiding tools to navigate this phase of your development? What's going on right now? Because if I give suggestions that haven't been asked for, I'm talking to a brick wall, but then I get all funky and say, God, I can't believe they're not doing what I told them to do. Well, um, when I get that, uh, did they ask for any suggestions? No. Mm, okay. They weren't interested. You wasted your time and your brain, and you know. So I'll say, would you like some feedback? Would you like some experience on that? When my husband and I first uh, got together, 20 plus, we've been married over 21 years now. So we were two years or so together and we thought about moving to a different house. We each sponsored two realtors. And I said to him, I don't want to use either of them. I want to make sure that our relationship as a sponsor, sponsee, is the singleness of purpose. And that our business or professional needs are outside of that. So nobody's feelings gets hurt. And I'm not on the phone. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Oh, just curious. Any, any listings come up yet? I want to, my role as a sponsor is number one. I can always get a realtor. They they can't always get another sponsor that they're willing to work with. What to watch for? The fade. The constant complaining. The uh, inventory taking. The, the flaking on calls. The negative attitudes that start to flare. And it doesn't mean that that can't happen on a now and then. We all get little funky people ways. But when it's persistent, I just had somebody choose to move on in sponsorship and told me they were going to take a break from AA at 19 years. And for over a year, they've had that kind of negative thunk, thinking and sharing with me. It came as a surprise, but it didn't. It broke my heart to see that. And I knew it was a decision made non-negotiable. I still gave it my old best shot, a couple, of, a couple of hits. But I knew it wasn't going to move that needle. But I needed to try. I can't make anybody stay sober and I can't make anybody get drunk. They do that all on their own. What about sponsees that have problems other than alcohol? These are two pamphlets that I find incredibly helpful. I don't have any problems other than alcohol. I need no medications to wake up, go to sleep, stay awake, stay alive. Many people do need 
help additional medications for living. I have no opinion on that. But I do recommend for myself, I have done this, and to every sponsee, read these and educate yourself so that you can best help that person. And make sure that if this is something they struggle with, work with a professional. Please work honestly with a professional on all of those areas. How do you let a sponsee go? I don't do it quickly. I don't do it meanly. I do it when it just seems to like have faded away. This is not a relationship they'd seem interested in anymore. Not Their words mean nothing to me. I'm looking at their actions. I don't fire anybody. I've never been hired. What we do sometimes propose is perhaps we should change the nature of our relationship to friendly. The commitments ex ex expire. They don't need to call, but I'm always welcome and open and I will always be gracious at meetings with them. The only time I've moved on in sponsorship, as we say, is because I've moved and I wanted someone local and then this last time because my sponsor died. Now, I mentioned to you the concepts and in closing, which is I have less than a minute, perfect. There is a whole chapter on leadership. And in that chapter on concept nine is this beautiful gem of sponsorship because it is leadership. Now the numbers and the highlight are me. So I'm going to read this last paragraph and then I'm concluding. This is true leadership particularly in the area of 12-step work in which nearly all of us are actively engaged. Every sponsor is necessarily a leader. The stakes huh, are about as big as they could be. A human life and usually the happiness of a whole family hang in the balance. So these are five bullet points and I'm gonna personalize these. Number one, what I as a sponsor do and say matters. It really matters. Number two, how well I estimate the reaction of my prospects. Number three, how well I time and make my presentation. Number four, here's, here's a jump. How well I handle criticism. They're always watching. How well do I handle criticism? Like an adult or a child? And number five, and how well I lead my prospect on by personal spiritual example. Not my yakety yak, not my quoting the books, my personal spiritual example. It says these qualities of leadership can make all the difference, often the difference between life and death. So thank you for your time today. I will stop the screen share and turn it back over to whomever. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.